Would you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your family? Sure. I'm John Frederick Jager, and um, I uh, grew up in Elmore, uh, went to school here. Family lived by Clinton Street, and uh, I was born in 1949, born in Toledo Hospital, but uh, um, uh, came back to Elmore and uh, uh, spent my real young years here and uh, years through school and high school. I was <clears throat> one of the last classes uh, kindergarten to uh, have kindergarten in the fire station. Uh, it was a long stairway that was upstairs and, and uh, so we used to have to crawl up the stairs and get up to the uh, second floor of the fire station for kindergarten. And um, then I went to uh, elementary school here and then uh, uh, junior high and high school and graduated from here in 1967, one of the last classes of, of Harris Elmore Schools. Right. Do you mind giving us your age? Uh, you're not a problem. <laughs> okay. I'm 62 years old. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit more about the schools. I That's a very interesting thing about being in the fire station. Sure. Well, I think it was, um, I don't know how long that they'd done that before, but I think that we were probably one of the last classes. <clears throat> and um, there was construction going on at the school, elementary school, and I remember that uh, um, I had uh, uh, classes in, in the school complex, which was out on uh, Elmore East Road or right at the corner. I don't remember what the street names were, but uh, um, I used to, to walk to school or ride my bicycle every year, and uh, I had uh, teachers this is this is kind of difficult. Miss Mrs. Winkler, I think, was my first grade teacher in the school. And uh, um, the early years, you know, I was kind of a naturalist, outdoor person at that time. That's what I do or retired from um, after 30 years with the Toledo Metro Parks. Um, and I think my earliest memories of uh, uh, growing up as a kid were were spent along the Portage River, which was right across from our house. We had the old Harriman Cemetery there, and then we used to go down over the hill and use the hill for uh, um, uh, sledding in the in the winter. And I remember the beautiful wildflowers along the, the hillsides there, bloodroot and other uh, wildflowers. I'm not sure if they're there anymore, but uh, that's where we spent time. And in the wintertime, we'd go down there and ice skate in the river. And I always tell people that I fell in the Portage River at a very young age. So, and in those days, it was kind of bad. It was a river? <laughs> it, it was a river. Luckily, it was above the outflow for the wastewater treatment plant. So, and, but at that time, we really didn't have, there was no uh, wastewater treatment plant. The um, drain pipe for the whole village came out uh, just below the cemetery into the river and emptied. Can you tell us, while we're on that subject, can you tell us anything interesting about living across the street from that cemetery? Yeah, it was neat because, uh, on, you know, there were old stones there. We didn't spend much time in the cemetery. We walked around it. There was a trail that went around back and went along the riverside, and then there was kind of a big dugout that uh, we had as a fortification. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I just remember it being kind of, you know, we were in town, but there was wilderness that was right along the river there, which was kind of neat. So, <clears throat> but uh, Laurel Van Camp, who was a, a, a really great wildlife officer for the Ohio Division of Wildlife, he was a game protector, and he studied screech owls, and he spent like 40 years of his, of his career studying them. He used to come across to our house, which was right across from the cemetery, and borrow our ladder to go up and ban screech owls and mourning doves in the great big uh, uh, tree that was a, the, the great big pine tree that was in the cemetery. I remember some huge trees around there too. So, um, but it, you know, that was uh, a cemetery that was actually built, I think, before the Union Cemetery. So that's the earliest cemetery that was in town. But uh, no, I never saw any ghosts or apparitions or anything like that. So well, there's always interesting stories. But, about. Oh sure. And I'm I'm glad to hear about the um, little dugout and the, yeah. the little wilderness because now it's pretty much collapsed and everything except the cemetery is gone on that hill. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I just remember beautiful wildflowers that were there, and then down in the, the floodplain area, there were these tall, um, probably um, 
you know, giant ragweed and things like that that make people sneeze. But for us kids, it was like a wilderness. We used to make trails and stuff down through there. So, but um, we were right across um, from the river and um, we were right across from the monument at the corner of Clinton Street and Rice Street. So every uh, Memorial Day, the, the Memorial Day parade came down there. And I remember, you know, seeing all of those growing up, uh, all, all the parades coming down there. I had <clears throat> two great aunts that came to live uh, back in Elmore. And one, one was here and never left. That was Aunt Julia. That was my great-grandfather's uh, um, great grandfather's daughter. It was my my father's aunt. So, and it was his would have been my grandfather's sister, uh, Charles Ernest Jager. And Aunt Julia lived in town. And then I remember Aunt Lucy came to live with her sister. And Lucy was married, and she lived in in Winter Haven, Florida. And um, the telegram arrived saying that she was coming to live about a half hour after she arrived on the bus. So, <laughs> and so she came up to the store where my dad was, our family ran the hardware store, and she came in and kind of announced that she was you know, coming to live. And it was like, my dad said, okay. So he ended up putting these uh, uh, two uh, elderly sisters, they were like in their 70s at the time, in a house uh, over near Harris Street, over near the Piety Hill area. And later he bought them a little uh, house on, uh, I think it was Huron Street or the next one over, which was Augusta. Lincoln, or one, Lincoln Street. Lincoln Street, yeah. There was, uh, he bought them a little house on Lincoln Street and moved them both in there. And uh, I'll never forget, um, Aunt Lucy was kind of a, an eccentric. Uh, she lived to be in her 90s and, and uh, Dad would take them food and, and made sure that they were well taken care of. And, and uh, Aunt Julia died first, and then uh, Lucy died. Not here, but Dad finally said, um, called up her son, who lived in Texas, and said, come and get your mom. You know, you really need to take, you know, I've taken care of her for 20 years. You need to come and get her. So he did. Marshall, I think that was his name, and Rosentrieger and came and got her, but I remember stories of uh, nature from her, and she was probably instrumental in kind of getting me enthusiastic about nature and, and forming a career. We got a call one time from the, from the uh, post office downtown Elmore, which was at the corner of uh, Rice Street near the railroad tracks there. I think it's still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the postmaster said, uh, aunt, your, your Aunt Lucy's picking up weeds along the railroad tracks. Well, she was out botanizing and she was getting probably dandelions and stuff and the railroad hadn't come through for probably 30 40 years and sprayed so it was probably safe to to gather dandelions in the spring to, to eat but it was a great town growing up um, we had uh, I had friends uh, Dick Myers uh, Richard Myers whose uh, dad was a funeral director and they lived in a big house right across from St. John's Church and we used to explore around there. There were some old tunnels that went underneath from the river up, and actually one of the air vents came out in the middle of Rice Street, and so it went that far back, and I'm sure it's been filled in by now, but who knows. I but think some of it's still there. They, they, they used just... to call it the, the mushroom cellar, he yeah. called it, and so we'd explore in there, and we'd spend a lot of time going out on the islands and stuff in the river, and then uh, my brother, uh, was a couple years older, so he had his group of friends, and we clear out, cleared out our backyard and back to have a baseball diamond, so we'd host uh, baseball games in our backyard, which we had an old barn. Um, I remember growing up, my dad had uh, two horses. He, he took care of horses, and then after he got a little bit older and the kids were born, he got rid of the horses, but we had two, and one had a real sway back, and it was, I remember the two horses were Milton, and the other one he called cement mixer because it looked like a cement mixer with its swayed back and a, a tummy that almost touched the uh, the ground. But um, we had an old barn and then uh, took the old barn and back and Dad said, well, you know, you can do whatever you want. And a neighbor, next door neighbor, John Howard, who was shirt tail in relation, Fred and Emily Howard lived next to us and uh, they had Sarah and Jane and John um, John was our 
real great mechanical guy and carpenter. So we had a, um, fixing up the barn floor and put a uh, basketball court in there and, and two uh, uh, basketball nets. And so everybody came down and played basketball in there too. So it was a real attraction to the neighborhood. And so, uh, but I remember as a kid, we had grapevines in the backyard and, and apple trees. And uh, my mom, mom was from uh, Toledo. She was, uh, she was a piano player, pianist, and uh, she uh, was a performer and met my dad, who was about 15 years older than her. And uh, they ended up getting uh, engaged and then getting married, and moved, she moved out to, to Elmore from Toledo and never, never went back, except to visit her parents who were in Toledo. Uh, but uh, they, were, they were great people. Um, Dad was the uh, third generation to run Jigger Hardware. It was started by my great-great-grandfather in the 1870s, and then uh, his son took over it shortly after the, the 1900s, and then my dad took over after his dad's death in 1939, and then I took over the store for a couple years and put it to bed after 110 years. So. Sure. Yeah, so. Before we get into the, mm -hmm. deep into the history of your family, can we um, maybe let you think about some of the stores that were in town at the time that you, sure. I don't care whether it was when you were young or when sure. you took over the store. Sure, A.J. Wise's store was, the, was there, it was a grocery store. Um, I think Tanks actually had a market in town and then moved out to their present location, which is out by the Turnpike. Uh, of course, Dora Dam Shorters was right across. And, Never forget it going in there because they had everything, you know, dry goods store. And I rem all I remember was that uh, th th there was an office in the back, uh, kind of on the second floor, and they had this little um, uh, wire contraption that they'd send bills, hook the bills in the front, and then send them up to whoever it was, if it was Dora and back, and she'd approve the, the charge or whatever, and then send the thing sailing back down. It was like spring loaded. And um, uh, that's one of those memories. And there was also uh, Myers Furniture, uh, and um, where he actually, I, I think that they actually did the embalming in the back of the uh, the uh, furniture store there, and that had furniture and caskets upstairs. A lot of the old um, um, morticians had furniture stores to help support them in sure. between uh, uh, times of. Uh, uh, selling caskets and, and doing funerals and stuff. Um, <clears throat> there was also the snack bar that was down in the corner, and that was run by Estelle Longnecker. And, and in the back, um, the Toledo Blade was delivered to all the paper boys, and I was a paper boy on Clinton Street. And so I delivered papers from kind of our house all the way out to uh, Clinton, all of the way out as far as Yastings, I think, which was uh, just outside of town. And um, I had like maybe 28 or 30 different people that took the paper. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it was a lot every to deliver every day. Sure. Um, and we'd get the paper. Estel was like the distributor for the blade, and it would come in there, and then uh, uh, we'd fold our papers and then put them in our paper bags and then s s head out. We never had any of those plastic bags that you slide the paper into today. Uh, we just had to make sure that they got on the porch and didn't get wet even in inclement weather. But uh, then there was also um, Hartman's Lunch, Dick Hartman, which was right across from um, kind of the Portage Inn. And um, I remember Depker's, Al Depker's. It was, it was a, a little snack bar that was there too. And um, was he a barber? I'm trying to think if he was also a barber. But I don't remember. Al Depker who ran a little shop there, was actually a pilot too, had his own airplane out at the uh, Harz Airport, and actually gave me my first airplane ride. Oh, really? Yeah, it was kind of neat because I caught the bug, and then when I um, ended up working through high school, I uh, worked in my dad's store, and uh, I would do um, sales, and I'd cut pipe, and, and do everything, cut glass, and then I'd earn up enough money on Saturday afternoon, I'd take off and run over to Fremont for an airplane flying lesson. I eventually got my pilot's license. So, and that was at Fremont with the, the late Gene Damshutter, who sure. 
unfortunately had had the accident horrible yes. accident yes. a couple of years ago yes but um, growing up in Elmore was great uh, I just remember the the neighborhood <clears throat> we had uh, uh, neighbors around we used to spend time with um, 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 we, we had a, a, f a few friends that we'd have over Myers there was a Bessie Myers um, who lived down the street and then she had a son um, Bob Myers who, who never married who s stayed there at home and he worked as an accountant and uh, we'd have they'd come over to our house and the Virginia Gregory who lived uh, that's Bruce Gregory's mom was um, uh, not too far from uh, the Town Hill Dairy Bar she was in the gray stucco house with green trim and uh, Virginia was a great musician she had I think been in the uh, uh, a vocalist and uh, grew up in Elmore, but uh, married a Charles Gregory, who was a flute player, and then he passed away at an early age. And uh, so we had spent a lot of time with uh, having Virginia over. And um, but it, it was some of the neat things about time uh, growing up in town. Um, Marquette, uh, I can't remember his name, but. Uh, he was right down at the corner of Lincoln Street. Dennis? Denny Markwood. Yeah, he used to, he had a, um, uh, we had a pet show or a pet circus in his backyard one time, and everybody brought their pets over in, in cages, and so there was a real menagerie, and I think I took our cat down, and, and uh, of course the cats were kept far enough apart from the dogs, but uh, that was kind of a neat thing that happened. So there there was life in town, and uh uh, right across the street from them were um, uh, houses. Um, um, who was actually uh, Virginia Gregory's um, dad, Henry House, and um, Bernard House lived there too. And Henry House worked in the store for a little bit of the time, but he he was known for painting up these beautiful bird houses that he had displayed all over his yard and that's what he did in his retirement made bird houses and right next to him were the rosines mabel rosine she was a substitute teacher used to come into school and i just remember mabel being we used to always kind of have a sigh of relief when mabel came because you knew you'd have a she never disciplined and she was the type that didn't need to because everybody just really enjoyed having her I don't know how she'd do it today in schools, but uh, back then it was okay. Um, school assemblies, I can remember some of them. We had Jimmy Nessel come in one time, and he was a, a birder that uh, came in and entertained the, the elementary and the high school one day. Um, he came up on, on the stage and did all these different bird calls, and very, very good bird calls, and, you know, the audience was spellbound, but I keep thinking today with today's kids in school and and I did a little bit of substitute teaching I know that it would be difficult for him to do that today but uh, um, without lights and oh sure <laughs> music. With, with all the media that we have today but um, I remember <clears throat> I'd always ride my bike to school and then usually ride home for lunch and I don't know 13 years of or tw you know with kindergarten I think we had half-day kindergarten, but I'm not sure. But uh, the, the the 12 years of going to elementary school and, and high school, I spent most of my time either going home for lunch. It, once in high school, I think I packed lunches, but one of the staples was chicken noodle soup and hot dogs. <laughs> We'd always go up to uh, Tanks or H.A. Weiss's and get hot dogs. And uh, um, that was kind of neat. Brandis and Troutman, I remember that, the meat, the meat market. And um, I remember we had a freezer, and so we, you didn't have a freezer at home. You went up to the freezer in town, and that's where you had your frozen stuff. But they used ammonia as a refrigerant at that time, so the whole place smelled like ammonia when you walked around. There was kind of this, you walked in the door, and it was cold, but you Very had this pungent. Ammonia, pungent ammonia <laughs> yeah. smell. From the, from the lockers. Okay, one more thing sure. before we go on to the family things. Sure. Do you remember the Elmore homecomings? Mm -hmm. I do. Do you have anything um, that really stands out in your mind about experience with those? Oh, I just remember, you know, it was in the town hall, town hill park, and it was kind of the same group. Uh, this is where the, the circus would come to town, and they 
come in on all these trailers and they set up the uh, uh, big top. And, oh yeah. yeah, there was there was one guy called Tiny was his name, and um, he he didn't move around very much. He was very 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 overweight and kind of kept in his little trailer and opened up the side and would sell stuff. And one of the things that he would one of the prizes used to be these big cigars that were about. Uh, you know, a foot long and maybe about two inches in diameter. Well, I won one of those once, and this was when I was a kid, and I ended up taking it home and I think smoking it behind the garage, and my dad kind of chuckled because he knew it would make me sick, and it did. It made me sicker than a dog. I'm sure they were horrible. Oh, they were just dry, <laughs> yeah. horrible things. And um, But I, I just remember... Um, that was one of the things I remember. And, and the rides, of course, because we'd never experienced anything before like that. But, you know, they usually had a Ferris wheel and maybe one of those things with the two uh, capsules at the end of a, that would just whirl around and make you horribly sick. And so. <laughs> so good but, memories. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think Dad kind of was always a little concerned that, you know, uh, about uh, going down and getting into trouble. So we, he was okay. Family was pretty strict, but not any uh, to the point of you know we're fearful or anything like that. But uh, I do remember the homecomings. Yeah. Okay. I remember high school and and band. Band was a big part of our music. Was a big part of our family. And, and what mom, did you play? Well, I started off with clarinet mm -hmm. and played piano first, but then clarinet and then uh, played French horn. And so I played French horn in, in junior high and high school. And we didn't have French horns for marching band at that time, so I was the bass drummer. And I remember one time during a high school halftime show coming off the field at uh, Elmore, and the bass drummer always came off the 50-yard line, and they used to have the great big rubberized markers that were like 50, 40, 30 for the, for the uh, uh, yard markers. Yes. And I remember coming off the field back toward the open stadium there, and I hit that thing, and I rolled twice, Cut, cut my chin, I think I still have the scar. And I rolled, and people thought it was part of the act, so they stood up and applauded. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> and I ended up going to right now and getting a couple stitches in my chin that day. That is a funny story. Yeah, it was a good story. I'm so. glad you didn't <laughs> really hurt yourself. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I really enjoyed nature. Uh, second grade, uh, I think I'm Mrs. Shannick. And, and, you know, you could, in comic books, you had these, you could either get like sea monkeys that you'd add water to and these fairy shrimp would float around, or you could buy an ant farm. So I wanted an ant farm, but didn't want to spring for the ants, so I ended up getting some ants and some material, and I brought it. We had show and tell yeah, yeah. back then, so I brought these ants into school, and she didn't really understand, but she had a fit, and she made me take that the ants out to the farthest part of the field where she could see from her second floor window and made me take them out there and dump them off. And I remember dumping them. So. Oh, gosh. Also remember when Kennedy was assassinated, I came over the uh, PA system and, and they chose to broadcast the whole things to, to the kids, which was probably the best thing that they could have done just to, to keep us informed. But I just remember being terribly shocked yeah. when that happened. Yeah. yeah. Myself as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, if you want to dive into family background, we're at that point, I'd say. Okay. So we'll let you take away, take it away. Okay. Well, my, my oldest ancestor came from um, uh, upstate New York. Uh, her name was um, um, Pamela... Banks, and she married, well, that wasn't her maiden name, but Pamela Banks was her married name. She married Banks, the miller in Woodville, and had some kids, and my great-great, that was my great-great-great-grandmother, and she had my great-great-grandmother, Lydia, um, and um, Banks died, her, her husband, so she ended up marrying uh, a Warner, Harry Warner, who was a really nice man, <clears throat> and she lived in Woodville. Well, she, then I had, um, um, this is um, 
Frederick William Yeager, who is my um, <clears throat> great great grandfather who came from Germany in 1843, and he was a German doctor. And um, <clears throat> he came with his wife and seven kids, three boys, four girls from Germany. And it was always said that he left because of conscription. There was a king of Württemberg that wanted him to enroll in the war. And he, he said to her that uh, Louisa, it's time to come to, to America. So they did. He spent a year in Albany and then eventually a year later, she came with the girls and his eldest son, and then they moved to Woodville. One of his sons was um, uh, Gustavus, and this is the earliest picture of Gustavus, that's a tintype, which was um, kind of neat. He was born in like 1838, and uh, Gustavus married um, the daughter of Lydia, no, married the daughter of Pamela Banks, who was Lydia Powers, and um, they, they had uh, my grandfather, who was Charles Ernest Jager, and I've got his picture, and um, Gustavus was the one that started the Jager hardware, and then here's, here's a, a picture of Charles Ernest, and um, so he ran the hardware store from like the 1900s uh, to 1939 when he passed away. And then my dad took over then in 1939 and um, actually ran the store until his death in 1974. Yeah, he had really wound down in the early 70s because he was having problems with getting sick and strokes. Um, but uh, here's, here's Gustavus again who had the, the tin type and uh, What's ironic about, uh, they came to this country to escape conscription, and yet two of uh, Frederick's sons ended up being in the Civil War, and, and one of them was Gustavus. This is his, his picture uh, when he was, he actually went up to Wisconsin, uh, where his older brother had gone, and they both enlisted in the Wisconsin Volunteer Infantry, and then he was wounded at the Battle of Chickamauga, and then came back to Woodville. And um, then after the war, there was this great big uh, <clears throat> movement with the Grand Army of the Republic, and the largest GAR convention in the in the country was in Toledo, uh, I think around 1911. And uh, Gustavus was uh, still around for that, and is wearing his GAR outfit. Um, what happened? Uh, Gustavus started the store in 1870, and uh, he, I believe it was with Otto Georgi, who was um, a prominent businessman, and Gustavus had gone up to Wisconsin to be in the war and then came back and then moved to Elmore. And so um, there were also a couple others, um, Jagers, that were around here. Godfrey Jager was one of the sons of, of uh, Frederick. He went on to become a, like a state senator and also published the first history of Ottawa County. And then another brother, Frederick, went on to become a doctor too, like his father. But he moved to the Toledo area on Front Street in Toledo. Um, Gustavus came here and started the store, I believe, with Otto Georgi in the 1870s. And, and Grace Lipke did a really good history. And so that stuff's written down and, and, and available. Yeah, available for people to see. Um, in the 1890s, um, the store caught fire, the back of the store caught fire, and inside the old hardware store, you could actually pl see places where the sheet metal roof had curled back from the heat of the fire, but they actually brought fire trucks out on flat cars from uh, Toledo Fire Department to fight the fire in Elmore, because the whole block was, was burning at that time. Um, when, I'm sorry, when was that? In the 1890s, okay. and I don't know the exact date, okay, that's, that's but probably figure it out. Um, but 1870 is when he started the store, and um, and then Otto Georgi got out of it, and it ended up being just um, uh, Jager Hardware. And they had hardware, and they had also milking, uh, they had De Lavelle milking parts and, and farm implements that they would sell. There was a complete tent shop in the store where they could make buckets and watering cans and everything. 
there was a large uh, eight foot long break where they could make sheet metal duct work and things. And uh, there was a great big soldering shop. So it was a really big fabrication shop that was in there. And uh, Gustavus operated in the store till about the early 1900s from the 1870s. And then he began to uh, start uh, worshiping with the Presbyterian Church, and he actually became um, almost like the story is like a missionary to, to Baltimore. And so he'd take off on long jaunts and go to Baltimore. It was said that toward the end of his time working in the store, that he'd close the store like at four o'clock in the afternoon and v invite everybody over to his house for prayer meetings. And that was over um, in an area of Elmore that's known as Piety Hill, and it was because of the prayer meetings and the every afternoon that it became known as Piety Hill, and it was because of my great great grandfather, and so he kind of went off the deep end. Um, his wife uh, Lydia uh, Powers, no, I'm sorry, Helen Helen Powers, she stayed at the house. Here's an old picture of them sitting on the porch of the house, which is kind of neat, and uh, great great grandfather's great-grandfather standing there with great-grandmother and this is her mother and then great-great-great-grandmother and then here's my dad my grandfather sitting in this rocking chair out on the front porch and that's available in the library too but uh, the guy standing in the center was Gustavus and, and that's why that area of town was called Piety Hill was because of the uh, prayer meetings that happened every day there Sorry about having a little trouble centering this one to get it okay. good enough. <clears throat> but it is available online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, <clears throat> because of that, my my grandfather, uh, Charles Ernest, really, uh, there was a Presbyterian church here, I believe, and that's where Gustavus went. He was also involved in the Grand Army of the Republic. Well, Charles Ernest Jager, my grandfather, was more involved with uh, the Masons, and he was in, in the Masonic Temple. And it's interesting, when he passed away in 1939, he didn't have a church uh, funeral. He had a Masonic, Masonic funeral, funeral sure. which was interesting. Okay, we're going to stop here and take a short break so I can change discs. <clears throat> we're, this is the continuation of the Jager family. Sure. So, Charles Ernest Jager married this... Uh, beautiful artist and singer and musician from Wauseon, whose name was Helen Heath. Uh, her parents were Gardner Everett Heath and um, Elizabeth Hatch Heath. And um, they lived in Wauseon. Kind of interesting, he was appointed the station master at the post office by Lincoln, which was kind of neat in Wauseon. So this is a picture of, of my grandmother who married this guy, my grandfather, and they had two kids, a girl and a boy, and the boy was my uh, dad, George. Okay, that's and, the mother and the children, yeah. and this is her husband, just dad. as a reminder. Yeah. And <clears throat> Charles Ernest uh, grew up in Elmore, very highly respected. He was on the school board. And, and um, he was on uh, the bank, the National Bank at the time, the bank board. And what time period is this again? This would be uh, kind of around the turn of the century up until 39. And he actually worked, he ran the store for 45 years, which was pretty amazing. And there every day, very well respected. Um, here's a picture of him, too. He's way over on this side there. And he was a rather short guy. And if, if you look at that picture, kind of a real close up, he's holding a cigar there too. I know I was mentioning about tiny cigar at the Elmore homecoming, so uh, he was having a stogie there in that picture. And he was really a, an outdoorsman. I, I know he loved Elmore and loved Tom, but he also loved, uh, you know, going out and going fishing and, and taking off on these jaunts. And here's kind of a neat picture of, and that might be Charlie Doty. He was an optometrist okay. in town, and they were friends. And uh, they went out fishing. That's probably up in a fishing camp, uh, maybe up in Michigan, or could have been across in Canada. 
and the other ones, uh, probably a fishing trip that they took up into Canada. So he really loved being outdoors. Um, and that's Mr. Doty in the, the I picture. I think with the round, dark round, glasses, yes. yeah. Who was, actually, was, would have been Dr. Doty. He was an optometrist. And, um, but it was kind of neat. And unfortunately, my grandmother died at an early age when the kids were, you know, he, uh, dad was probably in his, in his teens. <clears throat> And his sister was maybe in her very early teens. So, but there were aunts and stuff around that that helped my grandfather uh, raise them. And at that point, when uh, my grandfather got married, they moved to Clinton Street, which was the old Victorian house <clears throat> that was actually, I think, belonged to the Lucky family at one time. If you go back in the history, and my dad. George was actually born in the front room of that house. So that was kind of a neat one. They still had births at home. And um, <clears throat> it, they grew up there, but my, <clears throat> pardon me, my grandmother, she died in the 20s and she had Bright's disease and so unfortunately passed away. But she was a painter. She actually did some, some paintings, one of a dog and um, one of um, a lot of different ones. and. She went off to college. Um, she actually went to um, Lake Erie College in, in Painesville. Very unusual at the time. Yeah, and so she met she met a sister of my grandfather, who was also there, Carolyn uh, Jager, who's actually buried here in town. She moved to St. Louis, but she came back, uh, was buried back here in Elmore Cemetery. And so she said that she had this neat brother that, um, you know, she ought to uh, meet, and so the rest is history. And so she came home, they fell in love, which is kind of neat. And so um, Charles Ernest ran the store and was well-respected. Um, I'll never forget one time I was out, actually, when I was running the store, I went out and did a service call in Elliston on a, on a stove with this really elderly lady. And um, she looked at me when I came in. She knew I was a Jager. She said, are you Ernie? And I said, no, I'm, I'm John. She said, well, who's your father? Well, George, who ran the store for you know, like 40 years. Well, she had totally missed the generation of George. And so she remembered my grandfather from the 1930s. And that was kind of funny. But um, he had uh, heart problems and died in 39. And my dad had gone to Ohio State <clears throat> and actually was, um, he'd gone through the School of Architecture and, and graduated in 29. And so there was no work, so he ended up going to Zanesville to Mosaic Tile Company in Zanesville and designed mosaic tiles. Um, some of his tiles we, we still have as a family, and some of them are at Lord's College in Sylvania in the older part in, within the walls. And um, so um, and he also designed a few houses around too. So when he came back to the store, he, in 1939, he actually brought his architecture with him and uh, designed the, the home of Ralph Slates on uh, 105 near um, the Overmeyers, uh, right in the bend of the river and, uh, uh, and a few other homes around, and a lot of ranch-style homes that were constructed. Sure. So um, he used that talent and ability. So his dad died in '39, and so he he was actually out there running the store from like '40 until '74 um, when he passed away, and he was very well respected, and he was on the school board too. My dad, and also he was. Uh, uh, one of the bank directors of the Bank of Elmore. And so he he always loved Elmore and never really wanted to go. And if we'd ever take a trip, it was a day trip, and we'd go either to Mohican or we'd go to Crane Creek, and, and that was yet Mom would pack a picnic lunch for my brother and my sister and me, and we'd head out for the day. And uh, they were great parents. It was a, But he loved music. He was a violinist, and so he... And mom was a pianist, so they do violin, piano uh, duets. duets. And my sister became very interested in the oboe, and she was a professional oboist and just retired here a few years ago. Was in 
like the St. Louis Symphony and the Mobile Symphony and taught in Canada. And my, my brother still plays the flute. My horn's still in the case because I didn't like to practice when I was a kid. So I was kind of a disappointment to my parents because I was the one Jager that, uh, although I, I really love music, I, I'm not a performer, I'm an appreciator of music. So, But it was really great growing up here in, in town. And, um, you know, the events that we always kind of look forward to, I remember we had a brick street on Clinton Street, and we'd rake leaves, and you'd actually rake them down to the street and burn them right in the street on the brick. Now, you can't do that today with blacktop. And there's also the uh, burning, open burning laws that prevent that, and so they vacuum them up each year, but I remember the whole town smelling like, um, you know, uh, leaf burning in the fall and the pumpkins and then the seasons, you know, we'd maybe decorate, do a few decorations at the store, never anything really extravagant, but uh, it was kind of neat because when my dad graduated from Ohio State, one of his jobs after, com before coming to Elmore was in Chicago, he actually designed store windows at Marshall Fields in Chicago. So he was he was there for a time, and uh, but we certainly didn't do Marshall Fields store decorations here at, at Jager Hardware. It was maybe a string of colored lights and stuff, and uh, that was about it. But uh, I just remember springtime here was it was great with the uh, uh, red buds and the dogwoods coming out every year. Yeah. And, Everybody had a lot of flowers, and ten, there was much more gardening at that time. Uh, people had a lot of gardens that's turning around again, fortunately, and people are doing that again. But uh, when I was in high school, there was German, wasn't taught. And that's kind of interesting. After World War I in Northwest Ohio, we, before World War I, we were Jaegers. And then after World War I, we became Jaegers because of the anti-German sentiment. Yeah. And it wasn't until probably the late 60s, early 70s, that German came back into the schools. And so I ended up taking German from Ernest Freemark, who was on Toledo Street, along with Sam Harrison, who was a good buddy of mine, too. I grew up with Sam. And um, uh, Roger Gross. And we'd go there every morning and have German class. Well, it was very, I mean, he, he had an Egyptian mummy's hand. And he had scarabs and all these different things that he could bring out and, and we could talk German with. And so it was really a great experience. He was a, a really a knowledgeable guy that was a, a treasure for Elmore to have. He and Ernst, uh, he and uh, Edith Freemark, and they had a daughter, Ernestine, that lived here too. But uh, I, I should mention growing up with Sam, Sam Harrison too. I, I, his mother was Justine Motzik, Justine and Cal and uh, second marriage for her. And so Sam came and was immersed in, in town, and I remember meeting him for the first time. We kind of hung out together, and, and uh, I think his family and our family were the last two families to get television <laughs> in town. Everybody else had TV. My, my dad didn't believe in it. You know, I did have a shortwave radio, which was pretty cool. So I had this wire strung up in the backyard, and I could pick up all different stations. but. Uh, First memories of Sam, we'd go down in Sugar Creek in the spring, and we'd actually put on our hip boots and have lanterns and go out and spear. Uh, uh, we'd spear suckers and, and carp and then clean them and smoke them. Not light them. No, I know. What's we'd put them <laughs> in a smoker. Really good fish. Yeah. And uh, Carp is very good smoked. Oh, it is. And so are, so are um, suckers. Very, very good smoked fish. And I just remember, you know, learning a lot more about nature with those experiences and with Justine. And Justine went on to, to start the environmental studies program at Bowling Green State University, which is pretty neat too. The same so, Justine who's yeah. the artist. Oh correct? yeah, yes. that did. She actually, one of the paintings that she did was uh, the uh, doorway of our house or our home on Clinton Street. But uh, they were just great people. Cal still alive. He's the one that started Elmore Manufacturing in town right across the library here. But. Uh, we had a lot of really good times as, as kids growing up, and uh, you know, I was I was involved in band and, and track, and and uh, I just remember running out the country roads in track in the springtime. That was kind of a neat experience too, and and uh, 
I never liked to run that much, and so it wasn't wasn't that competitive. But it was a good thing for 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 socializing. So, at one point, you had mentioned also the Masons. Were you involved with the Masons, or was it just family prior? Just family prior. Okay. My my dad never was, you know, which is interesting, and um, you know, uh, dad really never went to church very much, and and I always kind of attribute it to to his grandfather kind of going overboard, really, with uh, it being kind of all-consuming, and he really literally took up the cause and, and uh, left his family to go um, to do this ministry in, in Baltimore and stuff. So that kind of alienated it. But yeah. we've come with a pendulum swung back the other way, so... Sure. Yeah. And I went, ended up going to St. John's United Church of Christ and getting confirmed and, and baptized there when I was a little bit older. And that was a really good church to, to grow up to, and I ended up being in the choir, and it was a, a really a good uh, community worship space that, that we had. Mom was very much involved. She was an organist at uh, the Methodist Church and then Elmore Christian Church. She was there for years and years. Mom had... Um, probably 30 piano students that would come after school and learn piano from her and a lot of different kids in town. That's a lot for this area. Oh, yeah. She was, Miss Tank was the other piano teacher, and there was a friendly competition kind of going on. But uh, Mom, Mom had a lot of piano students, and uh, the one thing that she really loved to do then after that was she accompanied a lot of the school plays. Um, once it became Woodmore, she... She went over to Woodville a lot, and was uh, uh, she did, that kept her young and kept her going after my dad died. She died in '87. He died in '74. So there was uh, uh, 13 years that she was, you know, by herself, and it was really kind of a rough time for her. But that helped to to uh, really uh, carry her through those rough times. Sure. Yeah. So, but it. Just a great community. I just remember our our home wasn't huge. It was really kind of unique. We had this this kind of peak Victorian kind of uh, lookout in it, and uh, I remember you know uh, we'd always look out the window and see what the weather was. My brother and I had uh, we lived in the part where the kind of oval windows were, and and uh, I remember when Great Aunt Lucy would come to the door, she'd knock at the door, and it would get we had these little fox terrier dogs and then get them all wild up when when uh, she would come to visit but uh, uh, really a great community to grow up in the so. uh, you had mentioned earlier too that um, well just the place that you had lived and living across from the monument the Memorial Day uh, parades is there anything because you had like a front row seat there is there anything that really really uh, moved you was there anything throughout your years that stands out? From those celebrations? From those celebrations, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I remember participating in, in marching band, and, and we always had these really heavy wool uniforms. And Memorial Day, I don't know if it's going to happen this year with all the rain that we've had and cooler weather, like it's it's in the 40s today, but always around Memorial Day, it would get to be a what, 80 degrees and you'd be standing out there in those wool outfits and, and uh, it was really a very, very warm. I just remember, you know, Flanders Field was always recited and also Lincoln's Getty, Gettysburg Address was recited. And then the Legion would come up and they'd fire off a couple volleys of uh, blanks and kids would run around to catch the, the spent blank cartridges uh, on the ground. Uh, but uh, it it was a really um, it was a time when um, when it was right after World War II that there was a lot of patriotism and I think a lot of participation in the community. Everybody turned out for the Memorial Day parade, and everybody would assemble down there. And I remember my great aunts, you know, having their dad a war veteran of the Civil War, always stood out there. Aunt Julia always would be out there with the American flag along with uh, with my great Aunt Lucy because their dad was in the, the Civil War. And I always remember her getting always too much heat and being dragged up to the porch and, and sort of passing out. Having the vapors. Quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's 
would you say swooned? Yes. So, yes. Yeah. But uh, um, it was, you know, you really had a sense of community and a sense of patriotism and a sense of, um, you know, everybody was um, felt kind of that unity um, there as a community in, in honoring uh, those who had died before, gone on before, and, uh, um, you know, I mean, uh, Elmore, I know, had a, a number of veterans that, from World War II and the Korean War that were um, injured and wounded and took care of those battle scars with them and on the Vietnam War and then, you know, the Mideast War, so, but, yeah. Okay. Um, anything more on your family or um, any uh, particular people in town? You've mentioned a lot of people in town. Yeah. Is there anyone who was a big, uh, you had mentioned the teacher who was uh, very much your interest in nature. You had not, you'd kind of skimmed over that a little bit. Is there a story about something specific with her that brought out that nature well, interest? That was great Aunt Lucy. Oh, okay. Yeah, who was, uh, she had a little guide, which is, I still have today, it's, it's, um, it's called the herbalist. It's all of the different wildflowers and plants and what they can be used for medicinally. So, and I think just, she would relay those stories and she, there was even a song, Sherman's March to the Sea, that she used to sing, which I don't share that with any friends that might live in Atlanta. Because that, that's still still a very sore spot in the South. But he was in Sherman's March, and um, she would would relay stories of the family and growing up and just um, you know I had these these great aunts who are around these uh, ladies that were uh, influential in terms of history. And I think that's one of the things not only that got me interested in nature but also in history, in family history, and. Um, I think every generation needs a, of a family needs a family historian to carry on that history. And uh, I have a, my daughters are all interested. I have four daughters. I have a nephew too that is a policeman down in Dublin, Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother and and wife's son David, and he's very much interested in, in the family history. And so he has Gustavus's sword from the Civil War and. He also has a picture of him on top of Lookout Mountain, and I think every soldier that was in the Civil War that was in the Chattanooga campaign got their picture taken on Lookout Point, so he's one of the many. But um, So that's kind of neat to carry on that history. Um, Bruce Gregory was also really important, who's in town, and um, um, I had I had sickness growing up. I had uh, rheumatic fever when I was growing up. So one year when I was like 12, I, I spent six months pretty much flat on my back. And they really, treatment's different today, but back then that's what they did. And Bruce kind of took me under his arm and, and uh, taught me how to make model airplanes. So one of the things, I made hundreds of wooden model airplanes. I got into also making model rockets. We would drill out the ends of CO2 cartridges mm -hmm. and fill them with match heads and then get a piece of eave troth and fire them off in the backyard, yeah. Well, it kept getting progressive. I got Estes rockets then and, you know, here I was in the backyard of a neighborhood, so if you'd fire something off, the chances of it landing on somebody's roof were really quite possible. And I remember one day sending away for uh, it ended up being a, a plan for a nine foot high metal rocket, which was supposed to have liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen fired, which was like a regular rocket that the military had used. I remember getting the plans and talking about it at home, and somehow those plans disappeared, and I never saw them after the first day. <laughs> so I think my dad said it enough at that point, and so he hid the plans, and so maybe they'll turn up sometime, but. Uh, Maybe if you'd lived on a farm. <laughs> yeah, maybe if I'd lived on a farm, it would have been a lot better. But sure. uh, Bruce was really uh, neat and uh, taught me how to make model airplanes, and so that was kind of neat to, to carry me over uh, during that time period. And so he was a really good friend of the family, too, and went on to distinguish himself as a bursar at the University of Toledo in, for years and years. And 
just a great, great person too. I remember when the Grobe family came for the first time. Hans Grobe, um, he was a um, he was a butcher that Tanks hired, and um, their first house was over on Rice Street, <clears throat> right next to to um, Norm Dam Schroeder's, and uh, they lived in an upper apartment. And I just remember transition was really difficult for them coming to this town and from Switzerland, you know, coming to Elmore, you know, where you were leaving the mountains and, and leaving that beautiful countryside. But uh, I think that they assimilated well. And, and my dad kind of took Hans under his wing, you know, the family, and we have visits with them and, and maintain friendships with them. Um, my mom loved Polly uh, Dreitzler, uh, who lived in the big house in the corner, uh, just down a little bit further. Um, she was a she was a vocalist, and so mom loved musicians. We'd have we had um, musicians that taught in the schools and step over in our house that were, you know, were affiliated with either Bowling Green or uh, University of Toledo. So we had a lot of musicians stopping by our place, and it was kind of neat. Were there any um, musical events that were held well the high school um the high school band events with the band yeah. concerts yeah. were really big we had some outstanding band directors in the high school band uh richard butts and then uh richard barber both came and uh, they did a wonderful job i remember it was a real exciting time because our bands would always uh, go to state competitions and win in the state and, and uh my brother and, and sister were always involved in, in getting music awards and, and going to contests and stuff. Me, not so much, but uh, uh, the band working together as a group, we did. And, but those were really neat events and uh, well attended. The concerts, band concerts were always well attended, not with just uh, the parents of the people that were participating in band, but uh, friends and neighbors and would, would come to those band concerts, which was kind of neat. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, any final thoughts? Uh, just uh, thanks for the opportunity to oh, do this. And, we thank and, you. Yeah, it's quite all right. And um, I think Jaggers were in Elmore from like the 1860s. Um, probably my great great grandfather, um, Frederick William, the doctor, actually came to Elmore, I understand, and, and opened up a pharmacy with John Elderkin, who had the Empire House in Stony Ridge. And, and so in his later years, he lived on Toledo Street. And um, then his son, Gustavus, bought the house in Piety Hill. And then uh, Charles Ernest bought the house on Clinton Street, where my dad lived and I lived. But um, um, so Jaggers were here from the 1860s until um, I left, or her mom passed away in the 1980s. Uh, she was here to 87, so okay. that was a long time to be here, yeah. over maybe 120 years, so long time. That is a long time. Yeah, so thanks. For well, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, great.